I'm just wondering whether we might have a general question now that uh, each of our speakers could address. And I'm thinking, you know, what do you see as the top priority for methods development or guidance? Um, and particularly perhaps considering the experiences that you've gained from synthesizing evidence um, relevant to COVID-19. So perhaps at the top of my screen there, we've got Hugh, um, if you could uh, give us a few thoughts about that. Okay, um, thank you. Um, so that's a really, really good question. Um, and I think that there, there was some discussion um, in, in the chat about, um, you know what what was out there that could provide a cookbook for doing non-randomized studies of of interventions um and we 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 discussed that there there are kind of textbooks out there but but there are, there really isn't anything which first of all <coughs> excuse me um which first of all comes from a um the multi um, disciplinary perspective that that we're used to um, in evidence synthesis. Um, so you know there there will be textbooks with by it from different um, academic subjects, but but not and and we know that these academic subjects use different types of study designs and some sometimes different labels for the same types of designs. So so there isn't really that multidisciplinary cookbook for doing primary studies. And at the same time, we're 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 still in the situation where we're developing or where we need to further develop risk of bias tools to critically appraise different types of study designs. And and there is work which is on ongoing. Um, as part of that, by our group and by the um, the bias uh, methods group, and there's, we're, we're working on a group with in Campbell Systematic Reviews um, for that purpose. So, so that would be my uh, top thing. Thanks very much, you, um, Ashrita. We didn't get a question for you at the end of your presentation. I'm wondering whether you could give us a, a few thoughts on on that question. Sure, so I'm going to talk uh, in relation to uh, evidence and gap maps, uh, since that was my area of topic. So uh, with COVID-19, uh, like I mentioned in my presentation, what we see was advent of uh, rapid reviews in the areas. And I think one of the key things with Campbell also, we started uh, having you know, rapid reviews and inclusion of rapid reviews into the synthesis. And um, you know, simultaneously, what we also did with uh, Campbell Mega Map was that we relaxed our inclusion criteria to not just look at, you know, systematic reviews in journal because, of course, they take a longer time that has to go through peer review. But rapid reviews are something that people can rapidly publish. We did include a lot of rapid reviews in Campbell Mega Map on 2020 updates. So, as a part of the, I can't say as a part of the guidance, but as a part of the next step now, what we uh, need to do, I mean, with all of those rapid reviews, they were really some good quality research being done by researchers. What we need to look at now is to you know, convert those rapid reviews into systematic reviews. And there have been few rapid reviews that are actually now full systematic reviews that were covered and captured in our 2021 update. So I think that is something which is equally important uh, to not get uh, those important research being lost uh, you know, as we move ahead with COVID-19, but also being those research being used into, you know, the evidence maps and also, you know, getting ahead into systematic reviews and, of course, or, you know, evidence summaries later on. Mm, interesting. May I ask also then and a generic question for the, then particularly to the other speakers. Did now COVID-19 um, uh, led indeed to a further development of the methods for public health, uh, yeah, public health intervention reviews, or did they actually realize how uh, far we are still behind and how much we still have to do. It's a little provocative, I understand, but. Kate, Andrew, <coughs> it's, it's. I think it's a really interesting question, Carla. I was kind of just reflecting also on what Ashrita had said, and also the number of speakers today who also talked about scoping reviews and the role of scoping reviews. Um, in, in the whole evidence synthesis process. Um, and I was reflecting on that thinking, actually, we, we haven't maybe given them the kudos and the, the, the level of importance that scoping reviews require. And actually, 
tying in with that, that the notion of the speed with which we were working, particularly at the start of the pandemic, and anybody who was involved in anything to do, I think, with public health or clinical um, provision, we were trying to get evidence out so, so quickly. And so for me, it's actually about, um, as Shrita just talked about, you know, whether those rapid reviews can turn into full systematic reviews, but actually is there a place for, for rapid reviews themselves rather than, and scoping reviews themselves rather than being seen as precursors to full systematic reviews and maybe increasing the prominence just because of the practicality and the pragmatic nature of those um, those reviews compared to doing a full systematic review and the time and resource we know that that takes. Um, so it's just my thoughts on, on hearing people speak this morning. Um, I think we need to speed up <laughs> in summary. <laughs> Thanks. Any final remarks by the speaker? Oh, Andrew. Sorry. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, um, I, I mean, I was involved in the, the first Cochrane Rapid QES, so so, so um, that really puts the pressure on the whole um, synthesis system. Um, I mean, going back to the, the question about guidance, I think the whole area of living qualitative reviews um, becomes an issue. They're, they've uh, been developed over a few years now, uh, now for quantitative effectiveness reviews, but um, in the Cochrane uh, work review that I briefly presented, um, we were finding that um, experience of return to work was, was only uh, limited data within studies about people's recovery in general from COVID. Um, uh, so we're anticipating that studies on the experience of returning to work will be appearing all the time through the life of our review. And so for us, the priority is, you know, those surveillance um, procedures for the literature in being able to find these as they come out. And so making sure when we go to, to publication um, that we have the, the sort of the current state of, of knowledge. And um, uh, people like James Thomas, who many will know, has developed the identifiers for randomized controlled trials, uh, certainly as, as one of our co-conveners is, is looking at how we might have these sort of surveillance methods for uh, qualitative research as it appears. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All speakers, thank you very much for being here and to, to kick off with this two-day method session. Um, may I ask indeed for the closing slide? So again, a great thanks for this for the speakers who made this first method symposium session uh, applicable and available to almost the whole world. Everything is recorded, so each one of us can uh, see it afterwards. And also it will be, of course, available on the Cochrane website. The next symposium is next week on October 18, where we are focusing on the challenges and opportunities. And of course, don't forget the other webinars that are uh, alive at 28th of October and 11th of November. And for more details, please see the link here at this slide on the website with all the upcoming events within Cochrane. Final slide. And of course, of course, not only the presenters need to be thanked, but this was not possible without uh, the uh, great input of, in this case, Dario, Oliver and Ella. Thank you all three because you made this available and possible to have this online session on, of this method symposium. And of course, the organizing subcommittee, Holger, Chen Ying, Jane, and Ella are thanked for this great seminar. Uh, I wish you all a very good day, also on behalf of Joe, of course, and, uh, and I hope to see you all at next week, October 18. Ciao.